Hi, my name is Arati Ganeshan, and I'm here with my colleague Sarvesh Mati to discuss three new bills set to overhaul India's criminal law system. On August 10th, the Ministry of Home Affairs introduced three new bills in the Lok Sabha to overhaul India's criminal laws. They are the Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Sanhita 2023, which is supposed to replace the Code of Criminal Procedure of 1973. We have the Bharatiya Nyaya Sanhita 2023, which is set to replace the IPC or the Indian Penal Code of 1860. And we also have the Bharatiya Sakshya Bill 2023, which is supposed to replace the Indian Evidence Act of 1872. Now, the three bills have been sent to a parliamentary standing committee for home affairs for further examination and recommendations. But what we noticed upon just sort of quickly going through them was that there would be a lot of impacts from these sort of updated laws on the digital ecosystem. So today we're going to be running you through some of the major highlights of these bills and how we think they could impact not just how we use the internet, but the kind of things that we do on it. So Sarvesh, the first question I had for you is, I mean, I know you've gone through the updated Code of Criminal Procedure, which in uh, the new uh, parlance would be called the Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Sanhita. Um, and one of the questions I had for you is how does it approach search and seizure laws? Uh, currently, we've seen multiple petitions uh, pending at the Supreme Court criticizing how digital evidence has been taken by law enforcement agencies, how it's been done in a way that infringes on privacy rights and other constitutional rights. So do we see those uh, issues coming up in the new Code of Criminal Procedure and have they changed for the better or for the worse or somewhere in the middle? Yeah, so uh, so uh, the cases you've covered, you'd have noticed that uh, devices are, are being seized, like personal devices, uh, phones, laptops, and uh, it's technically allowed under the CRPC because uh, these devices constitute as other things, uh, which any police officer or court can uh, seize if they think it's relevant to the investigation. What the replacement uh, for the CRPC does, it, it codifies this into law, and it uh, essentially includes the word uh, digital evidence and uh, electronic communication. So uh, the law says, uh, now it says that any police officer or court can summon any evidence, any digital evidence, including any communication device. And uh, communication device is uh, defined as uh, anything like a mobile phone or laptop, uh, even a cam uh, video recorder. So all of these are now explicitly covered, uh, which, uh, which does one of one of two things. One, it just legitimizes this uh, the kind of search and um, seizure that's happening around electronic devices. Uh, and the other issue we have is uh, even in the uh, cases that's pending in front of the court right now, uh, the main argument seem the two arguments are there. One is that a mobile device or a laptop contains a lot of information which might not be relevant to the case uh, because your entire lives, uh, digital lives, are on such devices. So there's a question about the uh, invasion of right to privacy uh, because of the scope of met, uh, information that's in these devices. And the second uh, thing is uh, such uh, collection of such devices might also go against the uh, uh, right to uh, right to protect yourself from self in incrimination. And uh, now with it being codified in law, it just makes it easier for the law enforcement and for courts uh, to justify whatever uh, collection that they're doing. And it, uh, so basically your right to privacy might be diluted and your right uh, against self-incrimination might also be diluted uh, because of the way it's codified into law. I'll, I'll give you one example of how this might be problematic because uh, I think in, back in 2021, uh, October 2021, uh, Hyderabad police was stopping random people on the streets uh, who were going on their bikes or whatever, and they were checking their mobile phones. So they basically took the mobile phones, went through the chats, and were looking for any words of, uh, uh, for like if the chats mention anything about drugs. So they were trying to crack down on drugs, and this immediately raised uh, questions about is this allowed? Uh, what about the privacy of these people? Is, isn't there a procedure to follow when confiscating devices? Uh, the police. Uh, Till the end, they said that it's lawful, but a petition was filed in the uh, in the courts. I think it's still ongoing, and many people raised questions about how this is not lawful uh, because the CRPC doesn't allow that. But now, if this uh, the replacement for CRPC goes into effect, such kind of uh, 
search and seizure might be legitimized. It, uh, the government will just have the permission to do it and uh, without any hindrances. So I think that's the biggest change uh, in the replacement for CRPC. And um, apart from that, uh, the CRP, the replacement also uh, talks about digitizing the entire process of uh, uh, from like, uh, you know, filing of FIR to maintenance of uh, case diaries to the delivery of judgment and everything that happens in court. Uh, the CRPC talks about modernizing it and uh, making it uh, fully digital. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like the witnesses appear uh, through digital means, the summons are issued through electronic means. So, there's provisions throughout the act uh, that allows for this kind of digitization. So, that's the two main takeaways from the, the replacement for the CRPC. Uh, you, you probably, uh, do you have any questions about this? I don't have any questions, but just a comment that I mean, when you spoke about the Hyderabad example, you know. Uh, that's sort of a clear infringement of individual privacy, which is serious enough as it on its uh, own standing. But even if you look at the petitions that were filed at the Supreme Court, one was by a group of academics uh, who found that their work was sort of being taken in a haphazard manner. Another was by a group of media professionals. And another was actually even by Amazon, uh, which sort of felt that, you know, the evidence collection procedures for digital things weren't kosher. So I think uh, beyond just individual rights, which obviously are important and are at par, we also have very serious consequences that we need to think about just in terms of academic freedom, in terms of media freedom, protecting your sources, protecting your channels of information, all of that, um, that we need to think about when we're looking at these revised provisions. And hopefully the committee looks at it as well. So that was just the only point I just wanted to raise over there. Okay. Uh but I think uh, also the other two bills, right? The one that's replacing the IPC and the Indian Evidences Act. I think the IPC in particular has a lot of uh, ramifications for online speech. Yes. Uh, you probably covered that. Do you want to just talk about some of the key points there? Yes. So, I mean, the IPC has always had provisions about, you know, not causing speech that creates enmity between communities, not uh, sort of uh, allowing speech that says one community uh, you know, should be deprived of their constitutional rights. So it's always been conscious of the fact that we're sort of a stitched together country and we need to protect that. Uh, what the new version does is it retains those provisions for, for the most part, but it just adds the digital elements. So earlier you might have said a printing uh, press or a pamphlet or a book, or maybe even a television broadcast. But now you have to think about, okay, we're in this digital world. A lot of those things are increasingly becoming obsolete. If you look at the channels of communication where hate is spreading or where inflammatory speech rather is spreading, it's often online. So you'll see all those old provisos have this kind of uh, uh, sort of thing tacked on saying electronic communication, which is what I think you were talking about as well with the CRPC. So in that sense, it's similar. What's interesting though is, um, I mean, I think some of the things that it said it's removed, it's actually not removed. So some, uh, for one example of that is sedition. Uh, as we know, last year, the Supreme Court basically stayed or put into abeyance, as lawyers would say, uh, Section 124A of the IPC, uh, which essentially criminalizes speech that incites gross disaffection towards the ruling Indian government. And of course, that provision has been used to put away a lot of dissenting and critical voices. Um, and it's sort of been described as more or less draconian. And when the bill was introduced in the Lok Sabha, the replacement, uh, the Home Minister sort of went as far as to say, you know, this law repeals sedition. But to their credit, uh, some legal news outlets very quickly pointed out that the law actually doesn't do that. Yes, the specific provision on sedition is missing. So 124A doesn't find that exact mention, but you have other sections in the bill which essentially say that um, you can't use electronic communication or financial means to excite succession, armed rebellion, subversive activity, separatism, or endanger India's sovereignty and unity. So um, as they pointed out, what you have is sort of seditious like or sedition adjacent offenses which have been included in the bill which are much wider and also have sort of a harsher uh, punishment as well. And I think another interesting thing here, and again, these are not necessarily new, but they're just sort of, they have to be read within the larger policy context currently is also how uh, the bill approaches defamation and misinformation. 
So the defamation part is new. Of course, defamation has always been an offense, but what they've added on as an example of what could be constituting defamation is a speech that is uh, deliberately ironical um, and who, who makes deliberately ironical statements. You have politicians doing it, you have comedians doing it, you have satirists doing it. A lot of the times irony is how you raise uh, sort of important points about yeah. in power. And that has been illustrated as an example of something that could be constituted, uh, that could constitute defamation and then incite an offense. I think provision on uh, misleading and false speech about the Indian state and government. And again, you can't use an electronic uh, communication channel to spread it. And we already have this issue uh, with the pre-existing challenge to the IT rules amendment as well, which came in April, which said the government can give itself powers to fact check misinformation on itself mm. online. And we've seen this cropping up again over here. It cropped up back then where you're essentially uh, allowing or sort of stifling the level of discourse that can happen around the government. And I think the consequences of that again in an election year uh, are all the more concerning. And even the satire point was interestingly brought in the challenge to the fact check amendment because the first challenge was brought by a satirist. It was brought by Kunal Kamra. And throughout the petition, they've essentially spoken, and in the proceedings in court, they've spoken about how satire uh, is under threat by a provision like this. Um, uh, because, you know, something that you say in jest or with irony could very well be constituted as misinformation and then have to be taken down, lest you lose safe harbor in India. So I think that's also a concern where we're seeing this trend of misinformation online, satire online, whether this is intentional or not, I don't know finding itself increasingly under the regulatory scanner. And it also makes me wonder what humor will look like in India. In yeah, <laughs> like it would be a sad state. Uh, <laughs> I think I, I think the court is actually also thinking along the same lines in the Kunal Kamra petition, right? So I hope something comes out yeah. over there. Yeah, I mean, we're expecting the Indian government to start arguments in a few weeks. So hopefully they'll yeah. have a strong rebuttal for why this is a concern. Um, and just a couple of other points on the uh, um, on the sort of new IPC replacement. And one thing which I think is actually welcome and is how they've approached the issues of cyber stalking and voyeurism. So the, again, these stalking and voyeurism were offenses in the IPC. And I think we've all seen cases just even in the paper online of how women specifically are often on the receiving end of revenge porn. Uh, of you know people circulating their sexual and intimate images without their consent. So in that sense, uh, what the new replacement does is it acknowledges that this is also a digital issue. So it says you know women who are uh, the victims of voyeurism, which would essentially mean uh, disseminating image images of them without their consent, or who are the victims of cyber stalking, should rightfully you know uh, be able to you know pursue an offense under this um, act. What's concerning to me, though, is that women aren't the only victims. And while, uh, you know, there are men who could go through this, there are trans people who could go through this. If you're just looking at the legal categories and operation in India, there are different kinds of victims that could go through this. And I think framing it through such selective language uh, leaves out a bunch of victims. I'm not sure how they would be able, like how, how would a man, for example, go and... Uh, ask the police to file a complaint about voyeurism if he can't be a victim under the provision. So I think that's some scope for widening the thing and understanding that victims and criminals can be from any gender and that every gender deserves equal protection, at least under provisions like this. Um, so that's one thing that's also kind of interesting and something that perhaps the committee will take up as well. So uh, the current IPC actually covers all people, right? It's not. Uh... Focus so, like if you look at the if you look at the um, provisions on voyeurism, uh, they actually are again in the context of women. So it retains okay. that language. What's different here is Section sixty six E of the IP Act. So Section sixty six E of the IP Act deals with non consensual dissemination of intimate images, and we had a massive judgment from the Delhi High Court recently on that as well. And if you look at that provision, that's much broader. It just says people who are the victims and people who perpetrate. So they kind of keep a broad acknowledging that it can happen to any gender or any community or class. So I think just introducing that language would be helpful here as well uh, to make it more inclusive. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to wrap up this video so that it doesn't become too long for our viewers. Uh, but if anyone is interested in getting a more deeper dive of how these three builds impact the digital ecosystem specifically, uh, Aarti and I have done a longer post on it. It's a 4,000 word post uh, heads up, but uh, it gets into all the weeds of the implications for the digital ecosystem. So uh, we will share the link along with this uh, video. Uh, thanks for joining us.